What's in a name? And the story goes that, at least back in England, they didn't have last names until the Normans arrived in 1066. The Normans introduced a, a number of new names to England, Walter, William, Roger, Geoffrey, and introduced last names or surnames based on a place of origin. Practice was slow to be adopted. In the 15th century, Edward IV issued an edict that everyone in the army have a last name so that they could keep track of everyone. There were too many Edwards and Harolds with last names that were monikers or nicknames rather than official last names. Someone called out for Edward the Unready and six guys all said, what? <laughs> me? You're talking to me? So now some of us are named for vocations, Baker, Miller, Taylor. Some of us are named for our fathers, fathers, or fathers, 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 Richardson and Johnson and so forth. Some of us are named for places like Hill or Shaw. What's in a name? If you're a Shaw and you've never lived in a small thicket of woods and neither did your parents or parents' parents, what's in a name? What's in a name when yours is common? I am David Shaw. So common that if you Google me, you'll find a football coach at Stanford with the same name and a former member of the British Parliament with the same name. And recently I had the interesting experience of meeting someone who stuck out his hand and said, Hi, my name's David Shaw. Whoa. <laughs> What's in a name when yours is uncommon? I was once waiting in uh, the church that I previously served um, in, a, in an area, and they were taking pictures for the church directory. I was sat next to a woman named Trajan. The photographer called out, okay, next, Trajan. Trajan, how interesting. That's, that's an unusual name, Trajan. And Trajan replied, no, not really. It's very common. So if you're the photographer, what do you do now, right? Is Trajan messing with you? Or is she playing it straight? Because you don't, you don't play around with someone's name, right? If you're going to have a laugh, a little joke about someone's name, you'd better know them well. What's in a name? Where does yours come from? What is God's name? Where does it come from? When you call out, cry out, mutter, curse, pray, say the name of God, what are you saying? Of course, the name, the word, can be said hundreds of different ways, right? When you bang your thumb with a hammer to a moment of joyous thanksgiving and everything in between. What did ancient Israel mean when they said the name of God? Or was it God's? Because 3,000 years ago, Israel, like its neighbors, was a polytheistic society. In the herbal, early tribal period, not the herbal period, in the early tribal period, each tribe would have its own patron god. When the monarchy emerged, the state promoted Yahweh as the national god of Israel, supreme over the other gods, and gradually Yahweh absorbed all of the positive traits of the other gods and goddesses. But the tension between being polytheistic and monotheistic is not at all erased from the biblical record. If you all, if you've dug around enough, you will know of some of the dramatic episodes of confrontation between gods and their prophets. First Kings 18, an account of a contest between the prophet Elijah and Jezebel's priests. Both sides offer a sacrifice to their respective gods, and Baal failed to light his followers' sacrifice while Yahweh's heavenly fire burns Elijah's altar to ashes, even after it has been soaked with water. This isn't just a contest over which God is better, although that's there, but rather how people will organize themselves under which values, under whose values, the God of an Israel or the worship of an outsider God. But there is more than one in the early days. Israel was slowly moved past this theological understanding. After the 9th century BCE, the idea of multiple gods will merge to there being one true God. And so later, even though Exodus comes early in the Bible, it is written at a time when Yahweh is the God of Israel, and Moses seeks out a name for what he believes is the one true God. Because he is in Egypt, and they have their own set of gods. And a burning bush is a heck of a way to get your attention. The voice from the bush calls out to Moses. 
Not by saying, hey you, you over there, yes you, but by using Moses' name. It is a call rooted in particularity, in a particular time, in a particular way, in a particular context, to a particular person. God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And God said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. You hear the double I am there, right? Moses hears the call and says, I am, I am something, I am someone, I am somebody. And God says, I am someone, some being somebody. I am the God of your father. And then God will tell Moses that, God has heard the cries of the people who strain under Pharaoh's rule and that God will set them free. But Moses has to lead the way and Moses will then reply, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead them out? And God says, I will be with you. And Moses said, well, who's that? If they ask me, who's that? What shall I say? And God says God's name. I am who I am. I will be what I will be. This is known as the tetragrammaton. What a phenomenal word that is, the tetragrammaton. The tetragrammaton is the collection of letters present here in the text describing God's name. Transliterated, it is Y-H-W-H, what we call Yahweh, but there are no vowels in the Hebrew. And so the precise meaning is left somewhat open. Some scholars believe that the most proper meaning may be the one who brings into existence whatever exists. Or I am who I am. Or I am what I am. Or I will be what I will be. Don't box me in, folks. The ancestors have therefore put forth an episode that suggests a number of things all at the same time. The name of God is both knowable and it isn't. In the way that God is knowable and God isn't. But to advance in the knowledge of the name and the being behind the name, Moses will have to then leave the burning bush and go and do. Practice and preach. Pray and educate himself. He will have to seek liberation for others. He will have to join in on the journey. And as he says that God is I am, he will have to reshape what he means when he himself says I am. Is he Moses or Moses and something else? Will he say, I am Moses, and also I am the one whom God has sent? I am Moses, and I am a follower. I am Moses, and I am faithful. I am Moses, and I am trusting and trustworthy. Whenever he begins a sentence with, I am, how will he end it? We learn that it is important to wrestle with who or what God is when we utter God's name. And we also learn through the interplay between Moses and God that whenever we say, I am, that we too are being called to wrestle with who or what we are. When God calls and you say, here I am, what is it that you are saying? What is it that you are saying when you say, I am Dave, I am Richard, I am Sarah? Upon what are we supposed to model ourselves? What does faith bring to this particular equation? What testimony exists that informs the name, I am who I am? God's name may feel ambiguous and unknowable, and yet you are invited into a life of seeking and prodding and probing for what lays beyond the name, I will be what I will be. And what do we learn about the name? What does the text assert? What is the macro story? The text will say over and over again in Exodus and elsewhere that God is a God of fidelity. That God is a covenant maker, a promise keeper, and remains ludicrously faithful to people. Sustains relationships even when people are ready and willing to ignore those relationships. The biblical text is marked by people who are not willing to engage in fidelity. They offer their own versions of betrayal and following their own egos and self-interest over and over and over again. Which means that God's mercy must necessarily extend beyond a quid pro quo calculus. Because mercy is not merely a quid pro quo 
quo calculus for God, and because God remains faithful when people are unfaithful, because God keeps promises, we are told, even when the other side of the equation does not keep up their end of the bargain consistently. We start to understand from the biblical text and from our own experience that there is a different way of being, of living, and of understanding mercy and neighborliness. We start to understand that we are being called into particular values precisely because of what we say about the faith that defines or helps define the character of God in our experience. And so we say, I am what? And we fill in the blanks. I am Moses. I am Dave. I am what? I am who? I'm called to let go of what? I'm called to cultivate what? Who am I? And that is going to be so important in the weeks ahead. This is not much of a trigger warning, folks, but I'm going to preach politics now. Just so you all are prepared, I'm going to preach politics now. I am who I am. Who is God? Who am I? Who are we? I don't blame anybody in the media for focusing on Robert Mueller's report. It's big news. It's going to be big news. Even if confirmation, confirmation bias kicks in all over the place around this country. Because the report will most assuredly confirm for you what you already believed. But it will undoubtedly remain news, big news. The lead story constantly in the days ahead. And I don't blame our local papers. They give people what they want to read. And people want to read about this report. And I understand why. It's big news. But I thought I missed it yesterday. <laughs> I mean, I went, I went through the paper, and then I started on page one, and I went through it again. And maybe it's just me, maybe I just missed it, but there was not a single word, not one word about Mozambique or Malawi or Zimbabwe in the paper yesterday. Not a word. The city of Bera, Mozambique, is a city of 600,000 people. 90% of it is destroyed and not a word. The death toll in Mozambique is approaching and will almost certainly surpass 1,000 and not a word. Why is that? Is it because it's Africa? Or another reason? And a little table and a little room in our church, some folks got together on Thursday night and had a meeting and decided... You know what? We need to get behind this story. We need to donate money to the United Nations World Food Program, which is trying to get food to people whose crops have been destroyed by this cyclone. We don't even know what's in Mueller's report. There's nothing actually to say other than it's been turned in just now. There's nothing really to be gained at just this moment. It is pages and pages of speculation as we try to peer in. Only a week or so ago, the Montclair Sanctuary Alliance, which is based at B'nai Keshet, and our brothers and sisters there have led the way in renovating an apartment on their property to house a family seeking asylum. A family from Honduras is now there, and they have a year to try and gain asylum through the courts. And all over this town, people from houses of faith are networking and resourcing, bringing food and helping with attorneys and medical care. And this congregation is a part of that alliance with First Kong and other communities. Thousands await processing. People have died in detention. Families are still separated from one another. We don't even know what's in the Mueller report. There's nothing actually to say other than it's been turned in just now. Today, after worship, we'll learn more about Kumak and their Pathways to Work program that empowers our brothers and sisters right here in our area who are trying to get resumes together, trying to gain life skills, trying to earn certifications and feed their families and make a way in this world and prosper well for themselves and their children. That's happening here after church today. It's a concrete, real way to prosper yourself to make a difference in the lives of others. It is a way to say, I am somebody called by God because of who God is and because of who I am. We don't even know what's in that report. There's nothing actually that can be said just now other than 
it's been turned in. I know it's important for our country. I know it's important. It's going to be important. And the question will be on our lips in the coming weeks. In what ways our identities will be shaped by that report? But will it be an obsession? Will it be where our eyes go every moment as people in Mozambique try to find food and shelter and people in Montclair support Isilees and people in Patterson try to find ways to work and feed their children? What is it that I am saying when I say I am Dave or I am Richard or I am Sarah? What is it that God appears to be saying when God says I am? The text will say that God in fidelity is the covenant maker and keeper, that God makes promises, that God seeks to offer guidance and protection for the common good that delivers prosperity to all people. God provides manna in the wilderness. God is the one upon whose name is on the lips of Mozambicans and Hondurans and us here in New Jersey. I am what? You are who? Are we the ones who can see the forest for the trees? Yes, politics is important. Yes, that report is important. Yes, what happens next is important. And people of God, there are other people of God who call out to the great I am in struggle. And we must ask again and again, who is my neighbor? Who are they? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Peace be with you.